morning, church family. I'll be reading from Luke 4, from verses 16 all the way to 21. And it reads as follows. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of, Lord, of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has given me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. And this is the word of the Lord. Thank you, church. My name is Lisejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ uh, through Fellowship City as pastor and elder of Fellowship City, along with Reino Mayer. I spoke earlier on uh, speaking about uh, being sent out. We were sent out by Rooted Fellowship and PVR um, to plant Fellowship City. This morning, I have the privilege of sharing the Word of God with you. So we're in a series titled Deeper. Through the series, we present an invitation, an invitation to know deeper, an invitation to understand deeper, an invitation to experience deeper, an invitation to listen deeper, an invitation to transform deeper, an invitation to see deeper, an invitation to feel deeper, an invitation to read deeper, an inv invitation to love deeper, an invitation to give deeper, an invitation to share deeper, an invitation to walk with Jesus. So why? Why an invitation to go deeper? Because we're a disciple-making church, and we are trusting God to work in our hearts and minds to accept the invitation that God gives. We believe that our people are under strain, our people are stuck in the complexity of life, stuck in autopilot, our people are not gospel-fluent, the gospel doesn't permeate through everything we touch, everything we do. We live in a world of, of bad news, broken trust from relationships, lack of hope from hurt, subtle rejections from home, from work, or from friends, failed goals, New Year's resolutions are a, are a thing of the past, uh, plans for this year are paused or moved into 2024, people live live with anger, with frustration, hopelessness, battle with sin in, in our hearts and minds. We live with alcohol taking us captive, pornography controlling our minds, our itching hands fueling our greed. Itching hands, for those that don't know, is just the, uh, a nuance that says that money is coming. So itching hands, for those who, who, don't, who, who don't know, it's itching hands uh, means greed or, or money that's coming. Um, so the world fights for our time, church. Um, Netflix, Twitter, and Instagram, hobbies like, like gym, running, fishing, and golf distract our purpose. Work consumes our mind. We want to do well and want to progress up the corporate ladder. We have idols, social media, work, family that choke our walk with Christ. Most of these things are good things. They're good things that we should do. But if this is where our treasure is, if this is where our treasure lies, if this is where we build our life, then we will be disappointed. We are filling a God-shaped hole with a fake shape that will not fit if, the, if we're putting our treasure in the things of this world. This morning, we will see an invitation from Jesus to fill the God-shaped hole in our life, to bring hope, to bring grace, to bring redemption, to bring freedom, to bring peace, to bring life. We will see the mission of Jesus and Jesus do a modern-day mic drop. So what is a mic drop, you ask? It is the process of deliberately dropping or tossing aside one's microphone at the end of a performance or, or speech. 
So, so one considers to have been particularly impressive and, and, then, and then drops, drops the mic. It, it can also signify triumph. So dropping the mic after a speech can signify triumph. It can also signify the end of a statement so definitive that it, that it can't be followed. So Eric B. and Rakim are two hip-hop artists who sang a song, I Ain't No Joke. The opening lyrics to the song are, I ain't no joke. I used to let the mic smoke. Now I slam it when I'm done, make sure it's broke. So this emphasizes the control. This emphasizes that, uh, that the gesture of dropping the mic because what I've just said can't be, can't be followed. Um, Kevin Hart, an actor and comedian, and James Corden, um, a uh, sh show host, um, performed uh, together sort of a, a dissing battle, if you were to call it that. Um, and at the end, the crowd, uh, through cheers, announced the winner as um, Kevin Hart. And what does he do? He uh, drops the mic. Um, or maybe someone, uh, someone else, Barack Obama, famously at the final White House Correspondents' Dinner, shared some jokes and then thanked everyone for support and proceeded to say, Obama out. <laughs> and then uh, uh, that signifies that he has done all that he came to do, um, was victorious, and he drops the mic. So we will see a mic drop moment in our passage. Jesus reads Isaiah 61 and drops the mic. There's nothing that can follow the great news that is in Isaiah and the fulfillment of scripture that we will see through Luke 4. So three points this morning. An, over, an overview of Luke, Jesus and his mission, Jesus and the mic drop, and our response. Let's pray, church. Lord, we thank you that this morning we can come together as your people to sing songs of praise and worship, to hear from you, from your word. I pray that you would quiet our hearts, quiet our minds, um, remove all the distractions, um, enable us to, to listen well, to hear the promptings of the Holy Spirit, enable the words to penetrate our hearts. May we see Jesus Christ as Messiah, as Lord, as Savior. May we see the mic drop and may, may we make the decision to be transformed by that. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our overview. Um, Luke is written by Luke, a physician by trade and a co-worker of Paul. The Gospel of Luke is about a compassionate Savior who has the weak and poor as his primary focus of his ministry. If you think about Israel at the time, it was a very class-conscious people, the weak and powerless, basically the outcasts, they can't help themselves. However, the weak and powerless here are actually those who see themselves as spiritually weak or powerless, spiritually in need of a doctor or powerless, spiritually in need of a doctor or a savior. The Gospel of Luke points to fulfilled scripture through the words of Jesus as a picture of the theme, the kingdom of God is near you. That's the overarching picture of Luke. The kingdom of, near, the kingdom of God is near you. Jesus brings about the kingdom of God through his death, his resurrection, and his ultimate return. So chapters 1 and 2 of Luke is an introduction to the book. It introduces John the Baptist, who is born and then calls people to prepare the way of the Lord. John also baptizes with water, but points to Jesus Christ, who is more powerful, who will baptize with the Holy Spirit, Jesus, who brings salvation from God and is God. In chapter 3, we also have the genealogy of Jesus, basically the family tree of Jesus. Jesus, a descendant of David and born to the Virgin Mary. Jesus is then tempted in the desert for the temptation. He quotes scripture to answer the temptation. He then starts off his ministry, which is to preach and teach, to call people to himself because the kingdom of God is near. So let's look at Jesus and his mission now. Luke 4. Our main passage this morning, we will see Jesus while teaching and preaching. He returns back home to Nazareth. He grew up there, verse 15, verse 15 6. He, he being Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And he had been part of many a synagogue there also. Because we see, it's the second part of verse 16. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So just a short side road. Uh, the synagogue is basically similar to a modern-day church building. It's a building designed for Jewish worship. 
This practice started during the period of Israel's Babylonian captivity, where the Jewish temple was not available for worship, but it had been destroyed and not yet rebuilt. So alternate places for gathering were needed because of the destroyed Jewish temple. So when, when Jesus was born and while growing up, synagogues were a formal practice. Some of the practices of the synagogue were meeting on the Sabbath and reading from a scroll. So Paul and the other apostles would go also into synagogues to preach primarily when entering a new community. So we see Jesus again in Nazareth, in the synagogue, standing up to read. He is past the scroll. Jesus then reads some Old Testament words from the book of Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Isaiah 61 and Luke 4 are two different contexts. However, they refer to the same thing. In Isaiah, we have the prophet of God speaking about someone who is to come, who is going to bring good news. What is the good news, and why is there a need for good news? That's, that's a great question. So the good news is salvation. It's forgiveness of sins and redemption because there are people in bondage, people who are saved, people who lack hope for the future, people who are blind and sick. This is true of the context in Isaiah. The Israelites were still slaves and prisoners in the Babylonian Empire. They were oppressed. They were held in captivity. Isaiah even says some need... Some need, need sight, meaning some were sick even in that context. So the Spirit of the Lord is on the one foretold to come and preach the good news. This will signify or proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor refers to God's restoration of his people from Babylonian captivity. The Israelites are held captive, turned into slaves, oppressed by the Babylonian Empire, who destroyed the temple of God in Jerusalem and held them captive. Chapter 61 of Isaiah has a title, The Year of the Lord's Favor. This is in the ESV or, or in, in the CSB, the translation is, is Messiah Jubilee. For the or, original audience, the year of Jubilee basically refers to the end of a 50-year period when a horn is blown and celebrations are in place because this year sig, sig, signifies uh, or, or involves the release from, from being in debt. All prisoners, captives, slaves are freed and their debt is wiped out. The land is the biggest commodity uh, as people work the land to make a living. It's also given time to breathe, given time to rest. So the year of Jubilee was seen as a, as a point of redemption, a point of forgiveness, a point of freedom by the Israelites. However, this is eclipsed by the anointed preacher of good news, the Messiah who brings complete and eternal redemption. So in Luke 4, in the synagogue, we would find the Pharisees and others in the synagogue who would have studied the Old Testament scriptures. They would know and believe that there is a Messiah who's coming, who will have the Spirit of the Lord on him, who will be anointed, who is coming to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and set the captives free. So we are seeing in Isaiah the prophet using a common idea of Jubilee and linking it to the Messiah, to someone who is to come and going to give the ultimate rest, the ultimate freedom, the ultimate forgiveness. So this person will have the Spirit of the Lord on them. They'll be anointed to preach good news. And there would be a celebration as they come. Horn would be blown. There would be forgiveness of sins and redemption would happen. People are freed, people are healed. This is the mission of Jesus, to bring grace, to bring redemption and forgiveness of sin. So let's see what happens uh, further in Luke 4. So verse 20, he then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began by saying to them, today as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. What is Jesus saying here? Many of you would know Floyd Mayweather. He is a former American professional boxer and now boxing promoter. He once said in an interview that Muhammad Ali was a great fighter, but I am better. Sugar Ray Robson was a great fighter, but I am better. That's a mic drop. Picture this moment. Jesus stops reading Isaiah at verse 2. So he only got to verse 2 of Isaiah. Doesn't even finish 
verse 2, because there's a second part to verse 2. He hands the scroll back to the attendant. You can imagine the eyes on him because he hasn't finished reading. The people in the synagogue, they know the Old Testament. They know there's more coming, but he hands the scroll back. Verse 20 confirms this. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. And Jesus makes an even bigger mic drop. Today, as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. Jesus here is saying that the one who is foretold to come has arrived. He says, I am he. Isaiah was speaking about me. What I have just read is fulfilled. Those in the synagogue are waiting for the Messiah, knowing that there is one greater who is coming. John has alluded to this one that is coming. They know the Son of God is coming. They miss the mic drop. They ask, if, isn't this the son of Joseph? And they ultimately chase him out of, out of town in Luke 4. We also see in Luke 7, uh, verse 20, which reads as follows, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? At that time, Jesus healed many people of diseases, afflictions, and evil spirits, and he granted sight to many blind people. He replied to them, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news, and blessed is the one who, is, who isn't offended by me. So the mission of Jesus was to bring grace, redemption, and forgiveness of sins. Why do we need forgiveness of sins? Because one, when God created the world, our identity was secure in God. We were in perfect relationship with God. Then sin enters the world through Adam then God makes a plan for our redemption through Jesus Christ. God is a just God, so there needs to be punishment for a rap sheet. So a rap sheet stands for record of arrest and persecutions. So this is all of our wrongs. This is a list of all of our wrongs. This is a list of all all the ways we put idols before God. This is a list of whenever we feel like killing our brother with anger in our heart. When we're converting what is not ours. The second part of Isaiah 61 verse 2 which, which Jesus didn't read in Luke 4, speaks about the vengeance of God, the punishment for our rap sheet. It says, to, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and, and the day of our God's vengeance to comfort all who mourn. This speaks about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus does not include this section because it has not been fulfilled, because there's a mystery about when this day is to come. He didn't read this because we are currently living in the year of the Lord's favor because he has come to give us his favor through the forgiveness of sins. So before we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, we have a long rap sheet, all of our sin. Jesus, the anointed preacher of good news, the healer and release of the captives, quenches the wrath of God, quenches the vengeance of God by dying on the cross for our sins and pins our rap sheet to the cross. So we no longer have a rap sheet. We are now the righteousness of God because of what Jesus has done. That is how God sees us. Because we have put our faith and trust in Christ. We have a new identity. We are redeemed. This is the grace. This is the good news that Jesus brings. The forgiveness of our sins. We sitting here should feel the mic drop hit the ground when we see the words, Today, as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. Because we know that Jesus taught, healed, and he died on the cross for our sins. We know that Jesus is the Messiah. So two quick side roads. Verse 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Limiting our understanding of who the poor are misses the truth. So limiting our understanding of who the poor are misses the truth. The poor here are not only physically poor. The poor here isn't a reference to their social status. The poor here doesn't discriminate between lower and upper class or doesn't discriminate on your bank balance. Revelation 3 verse 17 says, For you say I am rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing, and you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed, and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, and anointed to spread an anointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. The poor are actually the spiritually poor, the proud, the arrogant. 
Some people won't know the grace, redemption, and forgiveness of God because they can't see their absolute need for a savior God, regardless of their social status. So that's the first observation. Second observation, verse 18, also says to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. So limiting captives and blind to slaves and people who are clinically diagnosed as blind is missing the truth. The captives are those who are distracted by reality, those who are stuck in sin, those who are stuck in their love of the world. The blind are those who don't see their need for a savior king. Church, I believe if we don't have compassion and don't take action to help those who are captive and blind, then we should ask ourselves if we are disciples of Christ, if we are not part of the poor that need the good news. Our response. The invitation for us to go deeper is here. Today, as you listen, the scriptures fulfilled. Jesus Christ is the Messiah who has foretold to come. He has the Spirit of the Lord. He is called to bring the good news of salvation, to bring redemption, grace, and forgiveness of sins. We need to go deeper in our knowledge and understanding of God so that we are not tossed by the wind, so that we have a firm grasp of our identity. And we should live with our new identity in Christ because of Christ. We should not live holding on to our, the identity we had before Christ. Christ dealt with that on the cross. So how do we go deeper? We go deeper by relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. The role of the Holy Spirit in the Trinity is to point us to the cross of Christ, to conform us to the likeness of Christ. The Holy Spirit is powerful, and we see the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus. So Luke 1, verse 35, the Holy Spirit conceived Jesus through, through Mary. Luke 3, verse 22, the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus and anoints Jesus for his ministry. Luke 4, verse 1, Jesus left the river Jordan where he was baptized full of the Holy Spirit and is then tempted by Satan through the, uh, and through the word of God and the spirit of God, he resists temptation. Listen to what John the Baptist says in Luke 3. I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I am is coming. I'm, I'm not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Fam, you have the Holy Spirit dwell in you when you're a believer, when you've put your faith and trust in Jesus. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. The Holy Spirit points us to the cross of Christ and it conforms us to the likeness of Christ. The question is, are you pliable, church? Are you available to be shaped, to be modeled by the Holy Spirit? What is stealing your affection if you're not? Have you listened to the Holy Spirit prompting you? The Holy Spirit speaking to you? We go deeper by relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to conform us to the likeness of Christ and help us flee the distractions and evil of this life. Then we also go deeper by consuming the Word of God. Let the Word of God wash you and you every day. Feed your spirit the Word of God. Are you being filled by the Word of God or are you already full from social media, from gossip, from reading the news? Jesus used the Word of God and was led by the Holy Spirit to resist the devil in the desert. What are you using to resist the devil? Are you quoting t Twitter or Instagram? Or the Forbes rich list? Or the latest load shedding stage? The price of Johnny Walker? Or your last golf score? Or the price or location of the latest, newest sports drink called Prime? So what are you using to resist the devil? Are you quoting the word of God? Are you relying on the power of the Holy Spirit? We also need to be a prayerful people. Speak to God about the things holding you back, the things that are worrying you. What has your heart captive? Ask God to help you. No need hiding it from God, for he already knows. Speak to God. We should also live in community. God is a God of community. We see this through the Trinity. We should love being with other believers. And we don't have to pretend. We should be real. We should be honest. We should live together, encourage one another. We should pray for one another. We should admonish one another and find it great joy to be admonished so we are built up in Christ. Are you doing life with others? Does someone else know what's going on in your heart? You struggle with unbelief? You struggle with pride? Does someone know that you're hurting, that you're hard-pressed? 
We need to treasure these things, treasure community, treasure the Word of God, treasure prayer. We should treasure Jesus Christ above all things. That is why we should go deeper. So we fix our treasure on the right thing. So we're not tossed and swayed by the wind. Here's a quote by John Piper. Christ did not die to forgive sinners who go on treasuring anything above seeing and savoring God. And people who would be happy in heaven if Christ were not there will not be there. The gospel is not a way to get people to heaven. It is a way to get people to God. It is a way of overcoming every obstacle to everlasting joy in God. It is a way of overcoming every obstacle to everlasting joy in God. If we don't want God above all things, we have not been made, we have not been converted by the gospel. Let's pray, church. Lord, we're thankful that uh, we're living in the year of your favor. Jesus Christ came born of the Virgin Mary, lived the perfect life, died, rose again, ascended, and we know that he will return. That is where we can put our hope and trust in. I pray that whenever we face trials, that we would remember the cross of Christ, that we would remember your words, that your grace is sufficient for us, and your power is made perfect in our weakness. I pray that your, your word would wash us wash over us anew every day. We pray that you'd give us a hunger for your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would continue to speak to us, to tell us those things that you'd want us to know, to say, and to do. We pray that you would help us to not quiet the voice of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you help us to remember that we have a new identity. We are children of God. If we have put our faith and trust in you, And if we haven't, if we don't know you as Lord and Savior, we pray that by your Spirit that you would draw us close to you, that we may come to a working knowledge and faith in Jesus Christ. You are Lord of Lords, King of Kings. And we pray that would be what resonates in our hearts each and each and every day. We pray that as we part this morning that you'd speak to us, that you'd continue to draw us nearer to yourself, continue to remind us and affirm our identity in you, that we're children of God, that we've received the grace, the forgiveness of sins and redemption because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He is Lord, he is God, and he's Messiah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.